Come on, man. Are you seriously not gonna fit? But I'm getting ahead of myself, because to put this upgrade into the proper context, we must first go back to early 2020. This all began while I was helping my former roommate move. As we are rummaging through his pile of stuff, we stumble upon an old Dell Optiplex. With confidence inspiring phrases such as Wow, I forgot I even had that. And I'm not even sure that works. Do you want it? I was immediately sold. Taking a quick look inside, I find that it has an i5-2400, which at this point is a decade old Sandy Bridge processor. I also find four 2GB sticks of slightly mismatched memory, and a 320GB Seagate hard drive. Booting this beast up, I'm greeted by a fresh and valid <laughs> Windows 7 install? Well, I guess it could have been worse. Considering crypto functions better as a roller coaster emulator than a currency, and GPU pricing being inextricably linked, I checked for some affordable low profile cards that would fit this build. Luckily, I came across a nicely priced ASUS 1615 low profile and threw in a 120GB Kingston SSD for some lightning fast Windows 10 action. <laughs> Boy. But for what purpose was I putting together a cheapo desktop? You see, as my roommate was moving out, my girlfriend was moving in, and she was always complaining about her slow laptop. So I wanted to get her a decent enough PC for her birthday. Though, in reality, it was just a cheap ploy to get her hooked on WoW Classic so that she would willingly farm consumables for the industrial war machine. Uh, anyways, as it turns out, WoW Classic would not be the sole reason we found ourselves locked inside for the foreseeable future. WHO has been assessing this outbreak around the clock. Good evening. The coronavirus is the biggest threat this country has faced for decades. And this country is not alone. All over the world, we're seeing the devastating impact of this. If 56% of those people are eligible for remote work, that means over possibly transitioning learning from the classroom to the internet. It's now late 2022, lockdowns are a thing of the past, and the worldwide pandemic is but a distant memory. During lockdowns, everything that could be digitalized was digitalized. So with that in mind, the little old Dell has now become her daily drive. From digital art to remote work, uni projects, Zoom calls, and even video games. It has really become part of the course. By now, the Dell is really starting to struggle. From slow memory that's lacking in capacity, to a processor that's pinned under bigger workloads. Not to mention the sluggish drives that are getting maxed out. In other words, it is due for an upgrade. The only major component worth keeping in the current configuration seems to be the GTX 1650. So that gets to stay. For now. Consulting my wallet is a stark reminder of the current year. Luckily, I got a hundred dollar check from my grandma. So I guess that's the budget for this upgrade. With such a small budget, the most obvious upgrade path would just be throwing in a new 16GB RAM kit and the most powerful processor for the LGA 1155 platform. I quickly realized that the Ivy Bridge series of CPUs are off the table, as the Q67 chipset isn't compatible. With this in mind, the most powerful would probably be an i7-2600 or a Xeon E1200 series processor. Checking the pricing on both CPUs on eBay, the high-end Xeons that would inch out the performance gain over the i7 is more than twice the price. So, the 2600 it is. To get a rough idea of what performance gains I'd get from upgrading the CPU, I checked out previous runs for both CPUs in Cinebench. Performance increase seemed to be modest, with a 20% better score in single and 40% better score in multi-thread. In other words, nothing RAM breaking. To recap then, a 16GB DDR3 kit is around $25, while it's $30 for the processor. Then add shipping, and suddenly I'm looking at a sizable chunk of change for just a modest upgrade. At that price, looking for a completely new platform was starting to make a lot more sense. But eBay must have me confused for someone with a bigger budget, 
because shipping a computer to Norway costs on average $50. So I would have to redirect my search to the local secondhand market. After looking through an absolute myriad of badly specced gamer desktops from the past decade, I did find a promising prospect. A very nondescript looking system listed with a 4x3 monitor proprietary mouse and keyboard titled HB Elite Desk Core i3 Plus Monitor and Accessories. From the page, I see it had been listed for quite some time, with nobody bothering to save it. I shoot the seller a message asking for the specs, but he hasn't got a clue. Do I look like I know what a JPEG is? I can't for the life of me recognize the case, but considering that there's no CD drive and what appears to be a USB-C on the front I.O., I just had to investigate this further. I head over to HP's website where I discover that it's most likely the HP EliteDesk 800 G6. All of these models seem to have launched in late 2020 with a Comet Lake CPU. According to the listed PC's i3 processor, it would either be a 10320 or a 10300, both of which are decent 4-core 8-thread CPUs with a respectable 4.6 and 4.4 boost clock. What memory and storage configuration were anyone's guess, due to the countless options listed by HP on their website. But considering the 10300 retails for around $140 and the 10320 for around $170, it's probably worth giving an offer. On a whim, I asked the seller to buy it for half the listing price without a monitor and accessories. A few moments later. Nice. Two hours later. Now that this proverbial loot box has arrived, I anxiously turn on the computer to see just what a hundred dollar gamble has bought me. But as it boots up, it seems as though I've hit the jackpot because Windows loads almost instantly. For what I'm graded with is an i3-10300, a 256GB M.2 NVMe SSD and an 8GB stick of 3200 mega transfers per second memory. Which is a surprise when you consider that the 10300 really won't push past 2666 mega transfers per second, so it seems like the vendor get a little carried away with that one. Regardless, to say that I was content with the purchase would be an understatement, with comparable platforms from PC Part Pico costing upwards of $450 to buy in a custom PC. While a comparable OEM refurb is around $500, and not that it really matters currently, but this PC has native Windows 11 support, so it should be good in the OS department for the next couple of years. In terms of future upgrades, adding an additional 8GB stick of RAM is a no-brainer, but I could theoretically upgrade to a 6, 8 or even 10 core CPU on this platform. And should any GPU manufacturer decide to release a new low-profile card, I could even upgrade the 1650. So make sure you get subscribed so that you don't miss out on that potential money sink. At this point though, I was just content with the current build. All that was left to do now was just install the GPU so that I could run some comparison benchmarks. It was at this moment that he knew. He f***ed up. If you build a computer and you don't bleed a little, how did you really build a computer? Well said, Linus. I'd come too far to let some OEM measurement shenanigans stand in my way. Luckily, there are a few things a marker and some pliers can fix in terms of the DIY case mod. With the GPU firmly in place, I could finally run some benchmarks. 
To get an overall sense of what performance gains the 10300 would give over the 2400, I once again turn to Cinebench. Running the same 3D render on both processors reveals some great but overall predictable results, with scores in both single and multi-core being roughly doubled. But what is a nice surprise is that it also far surpasses the score of an average i7-2600 as well. So had I gone that route, I'd be left with slight increases, while this upgrade path made leaps in terms of CPU performance. Speaking of leaps, the generational leap from DDR3 to DDR4 and SATA SSD to M.2 NVMe SSD just makes for noticeably better Windows experience. Everything just feels much more responsive. But let's be honest, productivity benchmarks aren't all that exciting. What about gaming performance? How would the GTX 1650 fare on a new platform? To find out, I wanted to test three titles to get a good sample size. For all tests, I used MSI Afterburner and RTSS. Here, I include average FPS, 1% and 0.1% lows, as my prediction would be that while FPS may not vary that much in terms of averages, the frame times would. To remove storage from the equation, I used the same 240GB Kingston SSD on all games and ran all three titles on 1080p without frame cap. First up is CSGO, an older DX9 esports title. With everything set to high and anti-aliasing set to 4x, the 1650 did well to keep up. Though. I would probably need a stronger GPU, just to see how far I could really push the FPS difference on both of these CPUs. In terms of frame times, I noticed an overall consistency. The only real noticeable difference was around smokes and explosions, where the Dell would occasionally stutter. This was, however, completely absent on the HP. Overall, both computers made for an enjoyable gaming experience. Next up is GTA V, an older AAA game. With this game running DX11 with a medium preset, I saw much of the same story here as with CSGO. Running the built-in benchmark and playing through the prologue was mostly consistent in terms of averages. Where I noticed the difference was in the frequency of frame drops. Stutters became more regular and lasted for longer with the Dell, whereas the HP kept frame times very much smooth throughout. So while the FPS average was close, the difference in frame times began showing some discrepancies between old and new. Both provide a playable experience, though the HP has a leg up in terms of frame times. The last title I chose was Halo Infinite, a newer AAA game running DX12. Even with a low preset, this game really started to put pressure on the 1650. While the average is but a few frames apart, it's here I really start noticing the Dell struggling to keep up. Even just loading and navigating the game's menu was a horrible experience. The processor on the Dell was pinned to 100% from the get-go. This also manifested in frame times, as the PC was stuttering much more frequently than in both CSGO and GTA V. The lows in the game were noticeably worse and more frequent. This made for a lackluster gameplay experience. The HP, on the other hand, had no problem either loading or menu browsing. Neither was I experiencing many spikes. The overall experience playing on the newer system was just leagues better, and the results were a smooth above 60 FPS gameplay. Playing all three games gave me some insight into what you can expect when upgrading platforms. While the average FPS will not increase all that much, the stuttering and frame time discrepancies will be alleviated by a more powerful processor. This becomes painfully obvious when playing games developed for newer APIs such as DirectX 12 and Vulkan, where utilization of more cores, threads, improvements to instructions per cycle, and higher clock frequencies makes for noticeably better gameplay. What then did I learn from upgrading a PC on a budget in early 2023? And more importantly, what can you take away from that going forward? Heading into this upgrade, my initial goal was simple. Get the best hardware possible for $100. Since gaming performance wasn't taking center stage and being constrained by a small budget, I figured the GTX 1650 would do just fine. Thankfully, there are now several factors that make purchasing used PC hardware a highly feasible option. With that in mind, let's delve into these variables in the next part of this video. The launch of Intel Sandy Bridge in 2011 marked a significant advancement in the CPU market with its improved performance, overclocking potential, and low power consumption, all combined with a competitive price point. 
However, the same year, AMD's flagship bulldozer chip faced challenges, with single-core performance that even lagged behind Intel's mid-range chips. This setback was only amplified by getting slapped with a class action lawsuit for false advertising. This, along with years of trailing behind Intel, further weakened AMD's position in the market. With the benefit of hindsight, it's clear to see that Intel chose to reap the benefits from years of anti-competitive behavior and just roll out the bare minimum in order to stay on top. Now. I would make a joke about Intel being complacent, and that later coming back to haunt them, but I would first need to improve upon my punchline manufacturing process in order to deliver on it. It wasn't until six years later, when AMD, under the leadership of a new CEO, launched its Zen architecture that the CPU market would become competitive again. AMD's comeback with Ryzen and Epic, Epic, Epic line of processors now incentivized PC enthusiasts and professionals to upgrade more frequently. Not only because AMD was releasing good consumer CPUs, but because Intel was forced to actually compete again. This back and forth has been going on for long enough that the processors of yesteryear are actually great for several applications today. Case in point, the entry-level CPU that I bought is more than two years old, but it scores on par in both single and multi-core benchmarks with a high-end CPU from 2017. But competition didn't just come knocking in the CPU space. The stronghold that Nvidia's had on graphics cards has also somewhat loosened. Which brings me to my next point. After many years of ups and downs, cryptocurrency has had a bit of a branding issue. For many, it was treated as a gold rush, where mining farms were being set up as a get-rich-quick scheme. The impact this has had on the GPU market was felt by anyone looking to buy a graphics card. I think it's safe to assume that the time where a mid-range card going for two times the MSRP is over. We are now entering the era of Oh crap, I bought 10 GPUs that isn't making me any money. Better get some return on investment quick. While we have seen this phase before, the GPU market has matured to a point where there are more competitors to pick up demand. So if crypto were to surge again, prices hopefully wouldn't be impacted as much. Currently though, the secondhand markets are teeming with used graphics cards. Last to address in this list is the elephant in the room. For many people, staying digital was mandatory during the pandemic. If you had a job, school or a hobby that could be done remotely, you most likely bought some form of tech that allowed you to stay connected. Gartner, a consultant firm specializing in strategic marketing research, reported that PC sales in quarter one of 2021 was the highest year-over-year -year growth it had tracked in 20 years. Now, combine the disruption caused by COVID-19 with some very unfortunate and unprecedented world events that have affected worldwide supply chains. And the result is a global chip shortage. And while supply has steadily been increasing to meet demand, the residual effects are still felt when buying new PC hardware. So now more than ever, buying secondhand or refurbished is great if you're on the budget. That being said, I would strongly advise against replicating the small form factor build that I put together in this video. Low profile builds can be very limiting due to the small selection of GPUs that fit into this category. Even if your GPU supposedly fits, there's a chance that you'll have to make it fit even better. If your goal is to put together a cheap OEM build, I would instead look for an older Intel Xeon workstation as a starting point. These typically use a full height bracket and has PCIe power headers for GPU expansion. While it's hard beating a combined price tag of $240 for a whole system with both a modern CPU and GPU, you could do a lot better with a slightly higher budget. First, I will need to define what I mean by budget build. For the purposes of this video, I will use the $500 price point of the PC I found on Amazon as a baseline. On the surface, it may seem like an enticing deal. I mean, it's less than half of what these other computers cost, and it looks pretty much identical. But quickly looking at the specs, we can ascertain that this is a trap. Doing a quick search for these components on eBay, these parts on their own can be had for as little as $240. 
which is coincidentally the same amount that I paid for a much better system. And even then, this PC isn't really something you'd want in 2023. For $500, I bet we can do a lot better. To illustrate this, I will mainly focus on the most central components, namely CPU, motherboard and GPU. For the memory, case and power supply, I'll briefly display some tips on the screen, so pause the video if you want to read. Since budget builds will be hard pressed to maintain decent frames on 1440p, and even more so at 4K. And you know that one feature Nvidia has been trying to shove down everyone's throat for the past 5 years? Yeah, that one. Forget about it. GPU picks will therefore mainly focus on cards performing well on 1080p with ray tracing disabled. For GPUs, I've compiled a list of cards to be on the lookout for. These will vary in price, depending on where you are, and overall variance in spec between different models. While these cards are typically cheaper to buy secondhand relative to something that's new, that may not always be the case with sales and coupons. Depending on when you're watching this video, some of these recommendations may have stopped receiving active driver updates. Therefore, use them as a starting point and conduct your own research, as your needs and budget may differ from mine. Keep in mind that everything you see in here should be taken with a grain of salt. For the CPU slash motherboard combo, you'll be hard pressed to find anything better value than earlier mid-range Ryzen models. While these chips offer great value in their own right, the thing that sets them apart from Team Blue is the AM4 compatibility. This means that by purchasing a cheap CPU today, you can easily upgrade to a more powerful processor in the future with just a BIOS update, all without needing to also replace motherboard and memory modules. Besides, new AM4 motherboards are comparatively inexpensive, so if you can't find them used, they should be fairly cheap picking up new or even refurbished. Following these recommendations then, what could a semi secondhand build look like? For the GPU, I chose the 1660 Super because of its excellent 1080p performance. CPU wise, I went with the Ryzen 5 3600 which is a 6 core 12 thread processor with the stock cooler included. For motherboard and case, an ASRock B450 and Thermaltake Micro ATX to match the form factor. Two 8GB sticks of 3200 megatransfers per second memory to power the build, a 650W 80 plus bronze PSU, a Windows 10 Pro digital license, and I was even able to match the store's capacity from the scan build we looked at before, all while beating its $500 price point. If your budget cap is at $400, I was even able to accommodate that by replacing some of these components. Finding these parts on eBay took me less than an hour, and it's orders of magnitude better than what some of these cheap pre-builds can offer. Now, take into consideration that I only used one retailer, and that shipping wasn't included. But ideally, you'd want to find something locally to cut down on shipping costs anyways. Which brings me to my next point, price and availability. You may have a better chance of negotiating a favorable price for a specific component if it is readily available in your local secondhand market. My advice is to save searches and keep your ear to the ground for a few days before pulling the trigger. Now, with that being said, make sure you bring some healthy skepticism into buying used hardware. Use trusted websites with money back guarantees. Buy from sellers with a solid track record. Meet up in real life and test the parts yourself. Don't overpay. Check out historical MSRP for the specific component that you're looking to buy. For a more technical and in-depth guide, Gamers Nexus and Linus Tech Tips both have fantastic videos that I would implore you to check out before buying used hardware. And as a final note, there are obviously no flawless methods here, and you'll always be stuck in a pick two approach. But hopefully, my experience and advice will save you a buck by enabling you to make a more informed decision. If you've gotten this far, you most likely enjoyed these types of videos. So get subscribed, because the next project I'll tackle will be transforming the old Dell into a DIY NAS on a budget. And if you're looking for something to sink your teeth into right now, check out my previous stuff, where I repurpose an old camera. But for now, thanks for watching, and see you in the next video.